Hello students, this is an introductory narrated PowerPoint for NT518, Exegetical Explorations. In this PowerPoint, we'll be introducing the topic of biblical theology, which will play an important role throughout this class. The term biblical theology is used in a variety of ways, and so I want to give you a clear definition of how we're using it here. Um, we're using it in a specialized sense used in biblical scholarship. Um, here's a definition. Biblical theology examines the progressive revelation of God through the distinctive theological emphases of persons and periods. The key phrase here is probably distinctive theological emphases. Perhaps the best way to explain this is to compare biblical theology with systematic theology. Uh, now, the words biblical theology and systematic theology don't really tell us the difference. Systematic theology should be biblical, and biblical theology should be systematic, that it should be, that is, it should be well organized. What is different, however, is their focus of study and their goals. While biblical theology examines the progressive revelation of God through distinctive theological emphases of persons and periods, systematic theology is the systematization of truth based on the complete revelation of God. So biblical theology is limited to individual authors or collections or periods, whereas systematic theology is the broader study of truth in general, or truth per se. The systematization of truth based on the complete revelation of God. This could be include natural revelation, could be revelation through all of Scripture, Old and New Testament. Now, we could add a third category, of course, here, and that is not just biblical theology, systematic theology, but also historical theology. Historical theology is the study of how the church interpreted God's revelation during various periods of history. So we might study, for example, the theology of the early church fathers, the first generation after the apostles, or the theology of the reformers, during the period of the Protestant Reformation, or Anabaptist theology. Any theology throughout history is an examination of historical theology. So we might say that historical theology is a snapshot of the historical perspective of a particular period in church history. Biblical theology is also a snapshot, but it's a snapshot of an individual biblical author, the theology of Paul or the theology of the book of Revelation, for example. Of course, if you think about it, all systematic theology is also, in fact, historical theology, uh, since our statements about truth are always contextual and perspectival. Uh, that is, they're given within a particular cultural and historical situation. We may think that our perspectives are fully objective and that our theology is pure or pristine theology, but in fact, it's very much culturally conditioned by the situation we're in, by our background. Um, by our historical context. Nevertheless, the goal of systematic theology is the study of theological truth in general. So let me give you some examples of biblical theology to illustrate this. Take the theology of Isaiah, for example, or at least the first 40 chapters of the Isaiah. Um, the theology of, of the book of Ezra, we could compare and contrast with that. These two have distinct theological perspectives. Isaiah has a strong global and universal focus. He envisions God's salvation going out to all the nations. The nations are described as streaming to Jerusalem to worship God. So Isaiah has a very inclusive vision, um, a global vision of salvation. Ezra, by contrast, has a much stronger focus on separation and the distinct identity of the people of God. The book of Ezra was written after the return from Babylonian exile, and there was a, a strong thread of syncretism with the pagan peoples who lived in the land around Israel. So Israel calls on the people of Israel to, or Ezra calls on the people of Israel to separate themselves from the idolatrous influences of the people around them. They are to be holy and set apart. That's a key theme of Ezra. Now, this doesn't contradict Isaiah, but it's a difference in emphasis. Isaiah's theology, much more glo global, inclusive, positive towards the Gentiles. Um, Ezra, much more separationist, exclusive. We could look at a New Testament example as well, a biblical theology, by comparing the theologies of James and Paul. 
Paul, of course, has a strong emphasis on salvation by God's grace alone through faith. Um, James, by contrast, emphasized the significance and importance of works going along with that faith. He says, faith without works is dead. Now, these are certainly different perspectives. They're, contradict they're not contradictory, they're complementary perspectives, but they are different. Paul is writing um, in opposition to groups known as Judaizers. These are Jewish Christians who are claiming that it's necessary for Gentiles to keep the Old Testament law in order to be saved, uh, to be circumcised, and to keep the dietary laws, for example, if they want to join the community of the people of God. Paul strongly objects, saying that we're saved by God's grace alone, not anything we've done. Uh, James is addressing a very different problem. He's addressing complacent Christians who are claiming that once they've been saved by grace, they can do anything they want. They can live any way they desire. Um, a different emphasis, different theological emphasis. Uh, we don't have a contradiction again, but we do have different emphases. Uh, biblical theology examines the distinctive theological emphases of persons and periods. So we, we can talk about the theology of James, its particular emphases, and the theology of Paul. A second contrast between biblical theology and systematic theology is, is this. Biblical theology concerns truth from the perspective of the individual biblical writers. Systematic theology concerns truth per se. Let me illustrate this by talking about different biblical authors' Christological perspectives, that is, their perspectives on who Jesus is. Uh, John's Christology, you read the first 18 verses of John chapter 1 and you get a strong emphasis on Jesus as the Logos, the pre-existent Logos who came to earth, became a human being, uh, the Word of God, uh, emphasis on his Jesus as the Son of God and as the self-revelation of God. John's got a very distinctive Christological emphasis, strong on the deity of Christ. Matthew's Christology is much more what we call messianic, focused on the Old Testament promises coming to fulfillment in Jesus the Messiah. Uh, he loves the title Son of David, a messianic title, and Christos, or the Messiah. Look at then at Hebrews, the, the Christology of the book of Hebrews. Um, strong emphasis on Jesus as the high priest who offers himself as the sacrifice for sins. He is the great and final sacrifice that pays for the sins of the world. Very strong priestly uh, Christology there. So you've got different emphases um, in different authors in terms of the picture of who Jesus is. Now, those, that's biblical theology, talking about John's Christology, Matthew's Christology, the Christology of Hebrews. Um, systematic theology, then, would bring these together and give us a complete picture of who Jesus is. So here's a statement of systematic theology. As the Logos and the Eternal Son, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, made up of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He came to earth as the Messianic King, bringing the salvation promised to Israel in the Old Testament. That salvation was achieved through his role as the high priest, offering a sacrifice for sins, and it is now available to all who believe in him. So you can see that's taking um, Christological emphases of individual authors and bringing them together into a, a, a more global, complete statement of Jesus' identity. That's systematic theology. You wouldn't, you wouldn't make a statement like that with reference to biblical theology. Because Paul, for example, says almost nothing about Jesus as the high priest. And Hebrews doesn't speak of Jesus as the Lagos or use this, the title Son of David. So this is bringing um, everything taught in Scripture together um, to ask the question, what is true about Jesus? What is Christological truth? Um, so that's a key distinction between systematic and biblical theology. Here's a third distinction between the two. And that is that biblical theology is historical, whereas systematic theology is primarily philosophical. It's also historical, as we mentioned before, but it's primarily philosophical. And what we mean by that is it seeks to state the way things are. Philosophy is really the study of truth. What is the nature of reality? A biblical theology is much more historically focused. So biblical theology is a snapshot in time. Um, what an individual author or what a particular period taught or believed. 
Systematic theology is much more about unchanging truth. For example, if I'm talking about Paul's theology, I'm talking about the theological perspective of one person at a particular point in time. It's a historical perspective. Systematic theology is more philosophical and it asks the question, what is truth? All right, a fourth distinction between biblical and systematic theology is this. Biblical theology examines each stage in the progress of revelation, whereas systematic theology emphasizes the completed revelation. Now, we could break down what we mean by progressive revelation into various categories. Uh, the progressive revelation of God's person, for example. Uh, take the doctrine of the Trinity. In the Old Testament, we don't get a clear statement of the Trinity. Um, the unity of God is emphasized instead. You have the Shema, the great Jewish confession of faith from Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says, Hear, O Israel, the word of the Lord. The Lord, he is one. And there's a strong emphasis on the unity of God. Only in the New Testament is his Trinitarian nature emphasized, that it is one God, but who reveals himself in three distinct persons. So God's nature is progressively revealed in Scripture. Now, now you might ask, why is this? One, one likely possibility is that when Israel was struggling to maintain monotheism, in a context where all of her neighbors, all the nations around her, were polytheistic, were idolaters. God chose not to openly reveal his triune nature. It could confuse Israel. Um, is God three gods or is he one God? So only in the New Testament do we get the full revelation of God's person, of God's identity. Uh, that's the progressive revelation of God's person. Um, second, we have a progressive revelation of God's plan of salvation. Uh, by this we mean that individual authors did not fully understand the nature and manner in which God would accomplish his salvation. It was something that was gradually revealed over time. Hebrews chapter 1 talks about that. this, that in the past God spoke through the prophets, but now he has revealed himself fully through his Son. And so we don't get a full and complete revelation of the nature of God's salvation um, in any one place. It's progressively revealed. Here's an illustration of this. Um, Adam and Eve, um, the, what we also often call the, the proto-evangelium, the first gospel, the first good news after the fall of Adam and Eve. Um, Adam and Eve were told that the seed of the woman, that is the descendant from the woman, would crush the serpent's head. Uh, now, a rather obscure reference, but a, a reference that, that is about the defeat of Satan and the victory over uh, the fall of humanity, the, the, the victory over sin and death that resulted from it. Um, Abraham was told that through his descendants, all the world would be blessed in Genesis chapter 12. There's no reference to a personal Messiah, however. There's no reference that, that there's one individual that's going to come along and save uh, humanity, but rather that it, through Abraham's descendants, um, the world would be blessed. Uh, David was told that his descendant, would reign forever on Israel's throne. So David learned that the Messiah would be a descendant of his and he would reign forever in righteousness and justice. Uh, but David wasn't told that the Messiah would accomplish salvation by suffering and dying. We only get that um, in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53 tells us the Messiah will suffer and die. So there's a progressive, gradual revelation of the nature of salvation, how God is going to accomplish his salvation. So biblical theology is progressive. It's a snapshot at one particular point in time. We may not get a complete revelation at, at, uh, in any particular uh, doctrine or theology. All right, a fifth characteristic of biblical theology is that biblical theology is canonical rather than compositional. Now, what do we mean by this? Canonical um, relates to the canon of Scripture, that is, the books that we have that the church views as the Word of God. And so the focus um, of biblical theology is on the books in their completed form, uh, rather than the sources behind them or traditions behind them. Uh, for example, our focus is on Matthew's theology when we're studying Matthew um, in the context of biblical theology rather than the communities or the sources that Matthew drew from and was a part of. Um, in this sense, we're also not talking about the theology of Jesus, per se, but rather Matthew, Matthew's perspective 
Now, that's an inspired and authoritative perspective, but we talk about Matthean theology. The study of Jesus' theology would come under the methodology of, of historical Jesus studies. So we can talk about Matthean Jesus, or the Luke in Jesus, or the Mark in Jesus, um, which is, this is biblical theology, because we're looking at the distinctive theological perspective of a particular inspired author. Now that brings up a sixth characteristic of biblical theology, and that is that biblical theology focuses first on the diversity of Scripture and only then synthesizes for unity once that diversity is recognized. We mean by this that we have to allow the biblical authors to speak for themselves. Uh, too often we have a tendency to, to have a perspective, to come to the text with a perspective and then to impose that perspective um, on the text itself. But we want to let the biblical writers speak for themselves. Then we can seek an internal unity behind their diverse expressions of faith. All of what we have said should make it clear that biblical theology provides the foundation for systematic theology. Biblical theology must serve as a constant check on our dogmatic statements, and each generation should return to the biblical text to re-examine the biblical data and restate its theology on the basis of it. Two reasons for this, um, and that is, first of all, biblical theology views the biblical revelation in its proper context. Uh, secondly, biblical theology takes account of all the biblical data. So context is really the key. Um, and the biblical, biblical theology examines Paul in his context, John in his context, Isaiah in his context, etc. So in the end, doing theology is a three-step process. Um, we do our exegesis. Um, from our exegesis, we do biblical theology. And from our biblical theology, we develop a systematic theology. Exegesis means, of course, drawing out the author's intended meaning. Um, examining the text in its genre, in its historical context, in its literary context. Um, once we have done that to a text, we'll discern the meaning of the text, and the meaning of the text will determine each author's particular theological perspective. So exegesis determines theology, biblical theology, which then develops is used to develop our systematic theology. Now, of course, none of these can be done in absolute isolation, so this is not a a linear process. There's a, ma a, a measure of circularity in it. Our theology is always going to inform our exegesis. For example, what we know about Paul's theology is going to help us better interpret his individual passages. And so these, um, these three circle back onto themselves um, again and again to inform each other. But in general, we want to move from the original meaning in its context to the theological perspective of the author to the broader question of what is truth. So in summary, doing biblical theology is simply reading the text in context, something we talk about in hermeneutics all the time. Uh, let me just illustrate what we mean by reading in context. When we're reading a text in context, uh, we read a word in context. A word, the smallest unit of meaning, must be understood within the context of a sentence. A sentence, in turn, must be understood in the context of its larger paragraph. And it, the larger paragraph in the context of a section of a book. Books are made up of various sections. Um, and then each book, we could say, we could expand this diagram out and point out that each book or letter must be understood in its context. So let's take the letter to the Philippians, for example. Paul's letter to the Philippians is part of the Pauline corpus or the Pauline body of literature. We understand that letter in its broader context of Pauline theology. So you can see by this that doing biblical theology is just taking one step outward from, from the reading the letter in its context, reading the words and sentences in their, their context, uh, to reading um, those books within the context of the author who wrote them. So as we said, this class is going to be focused on biblical theology. We're going to start with Paul and talk about his theology especially focused on the letter to the Romans. Uh, we'll look at Luke's theology, compare and contrast the two. Some have suggested Luke has an inferior theology, um, that he's gone downhill from Paul. We're going to argue that that's not the case, that Luke's theology arises from his particular purpose and theological emphases. We'll be looking at the unique theology of the, the book of Hebrews and also the theologies of Peter and, and of James.
So we wanted to introduce this idea of biblical theology and, and provide sort of the justification for this emphasis on individual authors and their perspectives. Just a matter of reading in context.